This is your front load lesson for 333, DNA through the generations. We're going to talk about how chromosomes carry genetic information. The first figure you need to be associated with is this figure here. It shows a chromosome opening up or unwinding into the DNA double helix, and then a segment of that DNA is shown below called a gene. You'll need to know the difference between a chromosome and a gene. We talked a little bit about the Human Genome Product Project. If you'd like to go and look at all sorts of details about that program, a link is provided below. So what do we need to know about chromosomes? Where they're located, how many we have, and how the information is passed on. You should know by now that chromosomes are found in our nucleus. That's where our DNA is, and chromosomes are make up our DNA. Our DNA is folded into this complex structure called a chromosome. And as humans, we have 23 pairs. A pair versus a cro single chromosome is very important to understand the difference. Many students look at the word pair, and they don't conceive what that means. I'm going to imagine that I have five pairs of shoes in my closet. That means I have 10 total pairs. So understand that pairs are meaning that there's two there. So when someone says I have 46 chromosomes or I have 23 pairs, that's the same thing. Where did you get your chromosomes from? You got them from your parents. Your parents have 23 chromosomes, each pairs each, and out of their 23 pairs, they gave half of each one of those pairs to you. So imagine your dad and your mom sitting in front of you, wearing shoes. Take one of your dad's shoes off, take one of your mom's shoes off, put them on your feet. That's what made up your DNA or your genetic makeup. They pass these genetic um, pieces, these chromosomes, onto you whenever the sperm and the egg met uh, how many ever years ago you were born. This new information was genetically inherited. But there are things such as mutations that occur while you're growing inside of your mother. There's also in inherited diseases and mutations that come from your parents as well. These inherited diseases is what this unit is about. So reproduction. Um, reproduction is a process in which a new individual is created. Uh, the fancy ways to talk about this is that whenever you're ready to pass on your DNA, you only can give half of your DNA uh, to your offspring, and that is called the haploid number. And so 23 is the haploid number for humans. Whenever that sperm and egg meet inside of a mother, that is called fertilization. Fertilization restores the normal number of chromosomes, which is 46. That is called uh, fertilization, or the normal number is called diploid, D-I-P-L-O-I-D. Humans have all sorts of body cells, and in our bodies we only have one kind of cell that has to do with reproduction and passing on our genetic information. And those are our sex cells, also called gametes. G-A-M-E-T-E, -E, gamete. Sperm cells contain 23 chromosomes, and hum uh, humans' egg cells contain 23 chromosomes. Each, each different species, like humans versus dogs versus cats, we have different chromosome numbers, so understand that the number of chromosomes will be different for each species. However, in humans, when a sperm meets an egg, and this normally happens inside of the woman uh, during conception, it also can happen inside of a laboratory if a couple is having difficulties getting pregnant. They can go to a laboratory, donate their sperm and egg. A doctor will um, manipulate that sperm and egg and inject it into um, the egg and grow a zygote or a baby. Uh, it's called a test tube baby. They do this for, I don't know, two days or so, and then they put it into the woman, and she carries the child the rest of the nine months. So that is called in vitro fertilization. So just be aware that if anybody says, I was a test tube baby, or calls themselves that, all that really means is their parents were having fertilization problems, and they went to a doctor to have some help there. Um, another misconception that people sometimes think is that a more than one sperm can get into an egg, and that's what causes twins. That is incorrect. Twins does not result from more than one sperm in an egg. Actually, it's quite impossible for more than one sperm to go into one egg. Now, if I had 10 eggs and I put a whole bunch of sperm into that test tube, there could be one sperm for each egg, and I could grow 10 babies. Think about species such as dogs and cats. They have multiple um, offspring or litters. Uh, as humans, we tend to only have about one per birth. Sometimes we have twins rare occasions, triplets. After that, you're looking at some sort of in vitro fertilization um, gone awry. And so I wanted everyone to understand the difference between twins. Um, there are twins that are identical, and that's still one egg and one sperm. And for some reason, right at the moment that that egg, the sperm gets into the egg, a miracle happens. We still don't know the logistics behind it, but it splits into two identical um, zygotes. 
Then there's a, that's called f uh, identical twins. They're identically genetically. They came from one sperm, one egg. Then you've got twins that are completely different. They may look similar, like brothers and sisters. Uh, they could be two girls. They could be two boys. They could be one of each. This is called fraternal twins because it's no different than a mom having a child one year and a different child the next year. But just at that moment of conception, the mom's body happened to have two eggs inside of it that month. Normally, a woman's um, ovulation or no normal woman's cycle only per produces one egg per month, but there is a genetic condition or passed on throughout families. You've heard like twins runs in the family. Sometimes genetically a woman can ovulate more than one egg per month. And if that happens, the chances of having twins are a lot higher. Uh, it also increases with age, like over the age of 30, a woman's body tends to do this more often than normal. And so uh, one sperm enters one egg, and that is what restores the diploid number or a total 46 chromosomes. We call that a zygote. So a zygote is a normal chromosome, whereas our sex cells only have half. This is a picture of an early zygote under a microscope. If you notice, you've got your egg, and then you've got two little cells in the middle that look like they're starting to grow. Um, that zygote is the sperm and the egg that have come together, and they're starting to form or fuse. So what's the function of a chromosome? Well, we have 46 of them, so they probably are pretty useful. Those 46 chromosomes contain all of our genetic information coiled up into a tightly condensed structure, kind of looks like an X, called a chromosome. These have our genetic instructions, how to make our proteins, our traits, that kind of thing. We've learned that in class. Whenever you think of a gene, think of a segment or a piece of a chromosome. If you want to think of the chromosome like a train, and the gene is being the individual cars on the train, that's a really good analogy. So the section of DNA that corresponds to some sort of hereditary thing is your gene. Genes contain the information to make your proteins, and those proteins determine your traits. Um, there are all sorts of genes. Genes for hair color, genes for eye color, genes for skin, genes for how tall you're going to be. Remember, we're talking genes with a G, not like blue genes that you wear with a J. Proteins that consist of more than one chain are, can actually have multiple gene functions. So we'll get into po polygenetics as well. It's also good to be aware that chromosomes can have diseases um, because of mutations. So sometimes you have a whole extra chromosome or you're lacking one. Um, other times it's just a specific gene on the chromosome that's mutated or, di or different. For example, um, making normal, healthy hemoglobin or blood is what the normal gene chromosome 11 carries, that gene. However, on chromosome 11, if you have just a single point mutation, a single base substitution, that can cause the, mutate, the normal healthy D DNA or gene to be mutated or sickle shaped whenever it comes to the disease sickle cell anemia. We're going to talk about a couple other diseases such as Best's disease and a sex-linked trait called hemophilia in this class as well. We'll get there later. Um, but it's important to know the process of creating normal body cells versus creating sex cells. So let's break it down like this. Every cell in your body, with one exception, is produced with the process of mitosis. It creates normal body cells. The uh, other cell that we were talking about, our sex cells, our sperm or egg, depending if you're male or female, is cr created using a different process called meiosis. Meiosis, spelled with an M-E-I, is the process of making babies, or making the sex cells that are going to be created, turned into our babies. And that process only wants half of our original DNA in those new cells. So let's compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis real quick. Mitosis, or mitosis, is when you have two cells at the end that are identical to each other and are identical to the original. This type of Cell division is whenever we want to grow back normal body cells, like our toes, my tusis, our toes, body cells. See where I'm going with the vocabulary here? And before a body cell can grow itself back, it's got to double everything inside. So temporarily, it has more than 46 chromosomes. So when it's done, each cell can still have 46. This process compares to meiosis, which sometimes is people will say meiosis because it's got M-E in the word is whenever you're going to think about making think about it this way you're making little me's so you're either making little sperms or little eggs they're future offspring that are going to become you so think of meiosis or meiosis as making my sperm or egg this process only allows your sperm and egg to get half of your dna which is called 
haploid instead of diploid. We call those sex cells gametes. And we also have to go through the process just like we did with mitosis, um, but this process ends up with four cells at the end, so each cell has half of the original instead of just an original amount. So meiosis doesn't make two, it makes four. Here's a recap image for you when it comes to mitosis versus meiosis. Note that when it comes to the total amount of chromosomes, 46 versus 23, we're talking about in humans, different species have different chromosome numbers, um, so just apply the same information. For example, if I told you that a fruit fly has two chromosomes in its body cells, then it would only have one in its sex cell. If I told you a dog has 50 chromosomes in its sperm, then you'd tell me it had 100 in its diploid or body cells. You have to be able to know how to go from your mitosis number to your meiosis number, from your haploid to your diploid, from your diploid to your haploid. It's a pretty basic mathematical equation there, either divide or multiply. Um, so that recaps those. At this point, I want you guys to pull out some paper, and we're going to go over the different phases of how chromosomes move to create either a um, body cell, a diploid cell, which has all the same identical information, or how it has to do the process twice um, in order to make haploid cells. So pull out some paper, and we're going to go through this real quick, and I'll leave it up to you to pause and go back as needed. First thing I'd like you guys to draw on your paper is the word interface, and below that show a just a single dot, a cell, growing and doubling in size. Since this is technically not part of mitosis or meiosis, it's just the cell the where a cell prepares to divide. It spends 90% of the time dividing in this phase because it's doubling in size. All the organelles, all the chromosomes, everything is doubling in size. Then from there we go to prophase. Prophase, pro meaning beginning, is the first set step of mitosis and meiosis. Prophase is when the nuclear envelope dissolves, all the DNA is copied into things called sister chromatids. Notice the one on the left, where original cell started with two chromosomes. In humans we'd have 46 there, but for time's sake I'm showing you two. One blue, one pink. On the right, you notice they've doubled. Now you have two pink and two blue. Press the pause on the video now if you need more time to draw. The next phase is metaphase. Metaphase means middle phase, meta, middle. During the metaphase, chromosomes will line up in the middle, either left to right or top to bottom, and they will prepare to be able to be pulled apart. This is very, very important because you want half of the pink ones and half of the blue ones. You don't want it to get pulled apart any other way. There are these little things called spindle fibers. They kind of do the job of a rod and reel, like when you go fishing, they want to hook and drag the chromosome towards the opposite pole or side. Anaphase comes next. Anaphase is the third phase of mitosis out of four. Ana means apart. So during anaphase, chromosomes get pulled apart, opposite sides. Notice the line down the middle, sometimes that's called the equator or the midline. That's just right where the cell is going to pinch off and create two new nuclei or nucleuses at the end. And notice there's a pink and a blue one on each side. The last phase of mitosis is telophase or telophase. Telophase is when you get two new cells at the end and the DNA is identical during mitosis. It is when the cytoplasm actually pinches apart. That pinching is called cleavage, also known as cytokinesis. The splitting of the nucleus is a little different depending on what species you are. However, in humans, you do get this protein belt that wraps around and pinches them apart. Notice, there are two cells there and they are identical. Chromosome number, the color, everything's identical. The overall product of mitosis is to create two new cells that are identical to the original. This is for cells like your hair, your skin, your nails, any of your body cells. Now on to meiosis or meiosis, baby making time. Remember, I want to make little me's or little sperm or eggs, and I only want them to have half. So instead of ending up with two like we did in telophase, we're going to end up with four at the end that all have only half. So something like this. In order to do this, everything occurs just like normal as it does, but then we go through each phase again. So prophase 2 is a little different. The main part that's different is that you actually can have a process called crossing over occur, which is when homologous chromosomes line up and one segment of DNA can actually cross over to the next. So like one trait for hair color and another trait for hair color, you can get red and yellow to make strawberry blonde. Remember, only the same type of chromosomes can do this. You can't get eye color crossing over to hair color. During metaphase 2, in the making of meiosis, or sex cells, they also line up in the middle, preparing to be pulled apart. You still have a spindle, but notice that they're the same color in each cell. And in anaphase 2, they start to move apart. Notice there is um, a midline and equator beginning, which is where the cells are going to pinch apart in. 
telophase 2. The end result of meiosis, telophase 2, you end up with four cells that only have half each. These are gametes, they're sex cells, and they're going to be passed on to our offspring.